Woo! I love ghost hunting shows. Usually people hear that and they're like, OMG, me too. I love ghost adventures. That Zach Baggins. And I have to be like, no, I don't watch that one. Or maybe less often they'll be like, ghost hunters. And no, I don't watch that one either. The ghost hunting shows that I like are the underdogs, like the sad knockoffs of the popular ghost hunting shows. I'm talking my ghost story, the ghost inside my child, a haunting paranormal state, and its spin-off, Psychic Kids. But there's one that sticks out and is objectively the saddest. This show ran for only a year, 20 episodes total, on Destination America. Nobody I talk to has ever heard of it. It's called Paranormal Home Inspectors. <laughs> The idea of this show is pretty straightforward, although I'm not going to say it's good. Basically, someone had the idea for a ghost show that's also a home inspection show. So they hunt for ghosts, but they also examine the house for any mundane explanations for the ghost activity. So when you first hear the debunking angle, you might be like, oh, that sounds interesting. But if you think about it for like a second longer, you might be like, oh, actually, I don't know if that would make very compelling television. And yes, yeah. That's the problem. I have a box downstairs. The previous owners, they said we like you to keep this box on the land. I get an uncomfortable feeling with it. Boxes like this exist in houses. Looks like it's plywood underneath this. It's not antique. So let's move chronologically through the show. Each episode is divided into segments, and all of these segments are weirdly divorced from each other. You definitely get the feeling that some intern was just handed all this footage to try to edit together, like, okay, do your best. They even have the intro and the transitions narrated by a mysterious British woman, and this British woman is not a character on the show. She is not one of the three hosts. We are never told who or where she is. She's just another mysterious, disjointed element of the show. So, segment number one, the unidentified British woman gives us a rundown on the house we're about to visit. Our paranormal home inspectors received a call from a woman named Catherine. She claims that strange things started to happen shortly after she moved in and began renovating. The buildings are all extremely old. Most of them have seen heavy renovations. Segment number two, Michelle speaks with the homeowners. Michelle is basically the host. She appears in multiple segments instead of just one. We see her the most often. It begins and ends with her. I do not know why she's not framed as the main character and providing the voiceover. It makes no sense. So Michelle interviews the client and finds out what ghostly phenomena they've been experiencing. The show is already really good at this point because with a few exceptions, most of the paranormal activity is extremely unscary and extremely boring. I woke up in the early morning and I could hear water running. I went into the bathroom and my taps in the bathtub were on. My favorite thing is the producers have clearly seen better ghost shows where they'll have a dramatic reenactment of some kind of scary activity, but in this show, nothing described is good enough to merit a reenactment, and they just go for it anyway. And then I go back upstairs and the closet door would be open. Like in one episode, the husband is like, I came out of the garage and the TV that I left on was off. And the TV that I left off was on. And they have him reenact that, walking in from the garage and being puzzled that a different TV is on. Now, at this point, some of the cracks are beginning to show. We already know that this house is about to be looked at by a skeptical home inspector, and some of the beats feel a little too foreshadowed. I was overcome with a smell. Has the house ever been treated for mold or mildew problems? Not since I've owned the house. I did have to replace the roof. With that in mind, let's move on to segment number three, the home inspection. For this portion of the show, they bring in the shining star, my favorite character, Brian. Brian is a guy that does home inspections and that's all there is to it. Absolutely not an apparition. It was just a shadow. He doesn't have any particular showmanship or charisma. He doesn't even seem fully aware that he's being filmed for a TV show. He just slowly moves through the house, crawling through ducts, examining wiring. The fixture is nice and tight, so that seems to be okay. Next, we'll check the switch and... Yeah, well, here's the problem right here. We've got a worn light switch, which would suggest that it needs to be replaced. Crossing one thing after another off his list, 
joylessly debunking all of the ghosts we just heard about. Problems with computers. We found a modem in the basement that was draped over top of an electrical line. It's absolute no-no. He doesn't even fix any of the problems. He just identifies them. It's so weird in the midst of a ghost show edited with creepy camera angles and soundtrack screeches to suddenly have it grind to a crawl and just watch a bored man identify loose wires and improper insulation. We can see evidence of feces and where the insulation has been disturbed. There are a couple oddball investigations. Like there's one great episode where Brian figures out that the reason the couple is seeing a ghost at the top of their stairs is that the wall of the landing has unintentionally been painted with a human shaped optical illusion. We have a staircase and right above it you keep seeing a shadow peek out from about the shoulder up. This is so cool. The wall's obviously been touched up with two different kinds of paint. You got gloss paint and matte paint. It's very subtle, but this definitely could appear to look like the outline of a person. That's pretty cool, but totally explainable. So we we'll check that one off our list. But for the most part, this is the weirdest, funniest, boringest part of the show and doesn't match any of the other parts. Oh, also, if you want to play the paranormal home inspector's drinking game, you need to take a drink every time Brian identifies that a door has not been installed correctly. It, it's like every show. We're going to go upstairs and have a look at closet door. Door at the top of the stairs is an easy one. It's not level to begin with because the floor is shifted. The doors in this house are not hung properly. Properly. Close one door, the other one opens. They're only held on by magnets. These old latches also never latch properly. They're having problems with the door opening on its own. I can see right away that it's not really installed properly, is it? Back door closing by itself is not installed properly. And now it's time for segment number four, The Psychic. Renowned intuitive healer Nadine Mercy is looking for something Brian can't see. Okay, so the elephant in the room is that psychics on TV are just not very interesting. On a TV show, it's tempting and frankly expected that you will tamper with your results. I'm hearing the name. I don't know why. I'm hearing the name George. Something to do with George. I'm getting a Joyce or a Jay. A couple by the name of George and Joan lived here. As a producer, you can tell your psychic the history of the house and what the homeowners are experiencing, and then they can tailor their reading around that. And then you can just say, we didn't do that. Nadine has been given no information about the house or its occupants or what they have been experiencing. Sounds like more than a coincidence for sure. And the audience is like, oh, okay, yeah, sounds legit. Even if for some reason you don't rig the psychic, the psychic can rig themselves. It's not like you're throwing the psychic on the plane blindfolded. Like, they know where they're going, they can look up the local history. With all that said, I think it is important to note that there is a difference between a compelling TV psychic and a poor TV psychic. It's all in the showmanship, their acting ability. How natural can they make it seem that they're having these revelations? There's some dark energies, people have done some really bad things. How well can you act like you're experiencing extreme emotions from being in haunted houses? Oh my god. Goosebumps like a shot went right through my whole, whole body. <laughs> or look like you're talking to ghosts real time. I'm getting more three syllables to a name. The spirit had me write on a piece of paper and there was three lines. Three. I couldn't put a name when it had three syllables. Not to go too hard on Nadine, but I'm really not buying what she's selling. <laughs> sing, sing, sing. <laughs> Talk to me, baby, soft and low. Nadine says something about needing to breathe or having trouble breathing in every episode. I have this really heavy presence in my chest. It's almost like I want to breathe. From the kitchen on, I start getting heavy, can't breathe. Harder to breathe, energies just went up. I'm just going to ask everybody to calm down because it's a little bit overwhelming right now. Okay, here are the things you can connect to a psychic saying they need to breathe. Drowning, choking, hanging, being buried alive, trauma to the head or body, most terminal illnesses, being dead and therefore no longer able to breathe, as in all ghosts. Heaviness, boom, right in here, taking my breath away. We've got a furnace that is clearly not venting properly and is likely emitting carbon monoxide into this area. Nadine likes to say the vaguest things possible, which is fine on its own. I'm sure they teach you that in Psychic 101. If you want to be a psychic, you just have to walk into a building and be like, I'm feeling a heavy pressure, like something oppressive, pressing down or choking. 
a sense of being trapped or can't breathe. Wow, okay, I keep getting the words, get out. We don't want you here, get out. It's definitely a dark presence. Here I'm getting a lot of positive energy, youthful energy, something to do with children. The word child, either a spirit that was taking care of children or the spirit of a child, perhaps a mothering presence or a matriarch who's passed away. Mm, very peaceful feeling, a feeling of protection. Then no matter what kind of ghost haunting they've been having, if, if they had a grandparent die, or a mischievous ghost, or dark ghost things. You can just apply whatever you want onto the reading that you gave because you covered all of your bases. I guess to a degree that's probably what all psychics do, but I don't know, when Nadine does it, it's just painfully apparent. There's a lot of things that happen at nighttime here. I mean, she diagnoses every house with a minimum of three ghosts. I'm actually picking up an animal spirit. <laughs> Two elderly men. A lady. There's quite a few here, and I, I'm not sure why. The home's original builder, along with two former residents named George and Joan, and the two young boys that mysteriously disappeared from the neighborhood. He just brought more energies in, like a gang of energy coming right at me. There's a, a little boy spirit, his sister, a mother. It's a female spirit. Okay, another male figure just came in. There's a lot of spirit in this house. I don't know if I've seen any single ghost households on this whole show. And they keep cutting to these incidental shots of her doing goofy poses with her hands or body where she's like picking up the energy. I don't know, where I'm at with psychics is they kind of fall into two categories for me. Category one is sweet, well-intentioned yoga instructor psychic. And like maybe with these ones, you don't believe what they're telling you, but you can tell that they believe what they're telling you and their hearts are in the right place. Category two is carnival huckster psychic and they just want your money. Nadine's report is clear. She believes there is paranormal activity in the house. Nadine just strikes me as a little too much category two for comfort. But I'm not a psychic, so I'm not saying my reading is necessarily accurate. In one episode, she enters a house where they have what is clearly a memorial shrine to their deceased daughter. Like, there's a huge framed photo of her and candles on either side and, like, her face printed on a candle from a vigil. And Nadine walks to the giant picture and she's like, hmm, I'm sensing that this photo is significant. I'm being directed to look at this picture. Did she pass away? Wow, Nadine, you must be really attuned to the spirit world. Segment number five is the historical background. Michelle, our host from the beginning, goes to the local library or interviews local historians to see if anything spooky or tragic has happened nearby. Do you think a lot of people in the area in this town have experienced paranormal activity? I would say... Yeah. But she usually checks the whole town or like a 20 mile radius out from the house. While conducting her research, paranormal investigator Michelle comes across a story of a little girl who died close to the home. She was hit by a car right out on the highway, right in front of the store out here. Stewart's store. About how long ago? Well, that would have been in the mid 60s. And yeah, I used to think it mattered if the ghost had lived in the house or been to the house or been aware of the house's existence, it turns out that doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, fish gonna swim, ghost gonna haunt. Because the thing is, they are not going to historical landmarks. They're going to houses. And even with private residences, the ones with very famous hauntings or very sordid histories have usually already been visited by the bigger, fancier ghost hunting shows. What I'm saying is the paranormal home inspectors are not hitting the primo ghost hotspots. So ideally, they would like to find out that the house was built on a graveyard or had a gruesome murder there, but they have to cast their net a little wider or they're usually not going to find anything. So you end up with things like, there used to be a jailhouse a block away. Two doors down from you. It used to be a jail. Oh, I didn't know Two that. doors down. Okay. Or at some point in history, a body was found in the river that runs for miles and miles but also passes your house. Michelle soon discovered that there had been a tragic train crash in 1934 on the very tracks that run behind our client's home. Is the ghost haunting every house? Because in that case, I feel like none of those residents would even notice they were haunted because they would just have like one strange occurrence each and they'd just be like, oh, the door's open and not think anything of it. One episode is really bad. Like they find out about this disappearance of two little boys that happened in the city the house is in, and they spin this wild speculation that the boys were murdered, and at one time their bodies were hidden under the house. Now, 
They're, they're not there now, but they were at some point. In 1916, three years after this house was built, two boys down the road went missing without a trace. They were never found. Is there something buried down there? No. Was there something buried down there? Yes. This is all based on nothing, and they're just like, we did it. Solved that ghost. Two young boys that mysteriously disappeared from the neighborhood. Are they the spirits that haunt Catherine's home? Okay, this is the part I really have beef with. I think that going in to film a ghost show and slamming doors and bringing in your psychics and having seances, it's all in good fun. But when you start referencing a specific recent death, it just feels in poor taste to me. I mean, if it's like a Civil War soldier ghost, I literally couldn't care less. But if it's somebody who died like five years ago and they still have living relatives who knew them and remember them, just don't go there. Like, if there's a child who was murdered in 1996, you, the TV psychic, do not get to touch that case. Unless the family themselves came to you for, like, closure. But even then, tread carefully. There's this one episode, this family has tragically lost their daughter in what they suspect was a murder, but it was left inconclusive. They believe that she is now a ghost who is haunting their house, and they seem comforted by this idea, and the psychic is like, yes, it's your daughter, which, okay, fine. But then the team is like, we also read about this other young girl's murder that happened in this area, and her ghost is also here. In a wooded area very close to the property, a 15-year-old girl by the name of Dolly was found brutally raped and murdered. And you're like, no, hey. She's on the dance floor with somebody, big guy, manipulative, controlling. She had no clue. She didn't know what hit her. Wait a second, no. Could Nadine's experiences relate to Michelle and Matt's findings regarding the slain girl called Dolly? That other girl died in 2009, which is pretty recent. And her family didn't sign up for this. You don't get to use her horrifying murder as fodder for your stupid ghost show and have your hacky psychic making spirit hands and addressing her by name. Oh, back here. Dolly? Dolly, is that you? Do you have something to say to us? Ashley, Dolly? Anyway, at this point in the show, it becomes pretty clear why Nadine's psychic readings are all over the place. She gets to a house and they're like, here's your packet. And in the packet is like, the client is experiencing animal growls and mischievous behavior and demonic smells and child laughter. And then you turn the page and it's like, here is every violent act that's happened in this county since the 1800s. And then the producers are like, okay, Nadine, make up a story, we're rolling. And even if Nadine was particularly creative, there are too many disparate pieces to fit into a convenient narrative. So Nadine just ends up making up six or seven different ghosts to try to fit everything in. Segment number six is the ghost hunting. And this is another great part of the show. They bring Michelle back at night to the scary house and have her try to capture ghost activity on camera. In the pilot episode, Michelle is with another girl who is clearly the one that's supposed to do this segment with her. But the other girl turns out to be horribly afraid of ghosts and she quits the show in the middle of the first episode. She's gonna go crawl in a hole. Ashley, did you leave the house yet? Ashley? Ashley? My assistant Ashley developed such a headache that she had to leave the building. She never came back and she has subsequently quit the team. Well, that doesn't sound very good. I'm sorry to see her go. That girl had clearly been the one who was supposed to do that part. So for the rest of the season, they just kind of rotate who Michelle does the investigation with. And it usually seems like it's just their sound guy or something. The reason this part of the show is so funny is that it's so perfunctory. Like, the producers are like, hey, it's a ghost show. You have to have a part where they run around and doors are slamming and stuff. But on Paranormal Home Inspectors, this whole segment takes like at most maybe five minutes of the runtime. You can tell their hearts aren't in it. Notably, this portion is very transparently rigged because they never leave empty handed. There's always some kind of concrete ghost activity. And it's usually the same couple things like the motion sensors start going crazy, or the faucets turn themselves on, or doors are slamming. That sensor just went off on its own. Is there somebody up here? What the? Do you hear that growling? I do, yeah. The TV just came on. The faucet's on. The faucet's on. 
Whoa. That door just opened on its own. Look at this. The ceiling fan's on. I can't believe it. But then, and this is the best part, it happens every episode, Michelle at some point just goes, well, I think we have enough. I'm not even saying they transition to another segment. I'm saying in the middle of the investigation, while ghosts are manifesting and crazy things are happening on camera, Michelle just says, well, that's enough evidence for this house. Let's leave. I think we got enough. We're going to wrap up for the night and uh, go through the audio and video. We'll uh, end the investigation because uh, I think uh, we definitely got quite a bit. Yeah, I definitely think we got enough evidence. I think we definitely have plenty. Had a long night. I'm tired, fed up, and that's it. You're the boss. I like this idea that with the existence of ghosts wholly unproven, you can just get enough evidence and, and be done. Well, this spirit is manifesting physically to us in amazing, unprecedented ways, but it's done two things now, so that should be enough. What if Michelle was a detective at a real crime scene? Like, well, we've got a bloody footprint and the murder weapon, so that should be more than enough. Let's pack it in. Segment number seven is the recap and conclusion. The house was built by a plumber in 1913. This could explain why you've had odd issues related to the plumbing. Okay. Michelle presents all of the findings to the client. And it's weird because she presents them in the same order that we learned them. So she'll be like, here is Brian debunking all of your haunting activity in a very clear and dry way. We're here to present you with all the results. And we're going to start with Brian, our certified home inspector. And often the homeowner is like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, that's a relief. I guess my house isn't haunted. But then Michelle is just like, and here is me and a psychic confirming that the ghosts are real. So in summary, Brian has come up with some plausible explanations for what has been going on in the house. Mm -hmm. However, from what Nadine has discovered and from my investigation, I'm tending to gear more towards that there is paranormal activity going on here. And then the homeowner is like, oh, well... That makes sense, too. I guess my house is haunted. And if the client called them in the first place, they already thought their house was haunted, so obviously they're predisposed to believe that one. I'm very convinced there's spirits in this house. I would have to agree with her on that. And it ended on that with no counterpoint, so it's just kind of like, yeah, okay, it's haunted. And that's kind of it. Like, the episode ends there, the status quo is unchanged, they thought their house was haunted, and now they still think their house is haunted. There's never a resolution like, we're going to fix this problem we found with your house, or since it's a ghost, we're going to perform an exorcism or a blessing. It's just like, so that's what we found. And um, yeah, okay, that's that. And then hilariously, every episode ends with an infographic of the house they just went to. And then the words, case closed, even though nothing could be farther from the truth. So that's the formula. Most of these episodes are very by the numbers, and once you start to notice the patterns, it makes them exponentially funnier to watch. Like the epilogue, where they've clearly been fed a script and usually reuse the same phrases. Catherine seems at peace with our team's findings. Nick seems at ease with our team's findings. With the information that Brian gave me, I feel very comfortable. Ed seems comfortable with the team's findings. I am comfortable in this building. Cindy, Jacques, and the boys seem to be comfortable with our findings. I'm very comfortable. I, I feel I feel comfortable. We feel much more comfortable now than we did before. I'm uh, feeling a lot more comfortable. But it's almost more fun in the rare episodes where they deviate from the norm. Like, amidst all these episodes of buildings with no interesting backstory to go off of, they suddenly discover that this one guy's office building used to house an insane church of ghost-summoning socialite women. In the early 1900s, this block of buildings was home to the Spiritualist Church. The church's practitioners, who were mostly women, believed in the afterlife and routinely conducted seances in an attempt to contact the dead. And you're like, oh my god, I want to hear more about that. And then you just kind of don't. Like, the ghost activity is really lame. When you approach the fish tank, they all swim towards you because they think they're going to be fed. But quite often, we see the fish go in that formation up to the edge as if someone was approaching and there's no one approaching. And you're like, wait, no, go back to the ghost society. 
I want to hear about that. We as mortals can communicate with the spirit world. My list says something about fish. In one of the most bonkers episodes, a man thinks his house is haunted by the ghost of his recently deceased mother. So it seems like they have a pretty good thread to work along. But amongst all his other ghost activities, he mentions that he has what is pretty clearly sleepwalking and sleep paralysis. So Michelle hears this and is like, oh... Clearly that's sleep paralysis and you're like, oh, thank goodness. Like she gets it. She's not gonna make it a ghost thing But then Michelle is like sleep paralysis is a symptom of Aliens some yeah. people who have been experiencing abduction have reported that they experience sleep paralysis as well Wow. Could alien beings be visiting Alex? Michelle continues her research into the matter. Yeah, great Michelle. Let me know what you come up with. And then there's an interlude of Michelle looking at the government files and confirming that there's been a rash of alien abductions in the area. Michelle looked into government UFO files and made some startling discoveries. I have just found six reports of UFO sightings in the government files. This show is so odd. The hosts are weird. Michelle is the most natural as a TV host, but it's not framed around her for whatever reason. I don't understand how she got relegated to Ghost Hunter when that doesn't seem to be a thing she's particularly interested in. Nadine Mercy seems like she's just frantically grasping at straws the entire time she's on camera. Seeing a cemetery, headstone, a lady's funeral. She's here now. Wasn't my choice. She says, forgive me, I'm sorry. Uncontrollable circumstances. Which makes you kind of secondhand anxious as a viewer. And Brian seems to have a dry sense of humor, but just so little investment in trying to be entertaining in his parts of the show. Fireplace going on and off on its own. Apparently it's been coming on and off by itself. So the problem seems to have occurred down here with the electronics. And then look at this. We can see right here. The wires are loose. This is an easy fix. Sometimes he'll even straight up accuse the clients of sleepwalking or lying, which usually makes them angry and just makes everything really uncomfortable. And this is busted. What did you think? Can I take a break? Sorry. <laughs> you okay? I can get her mine. Yeah. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. On top of that, None of the three hosts' paths ever cross. They always visit the house at different times and we never see them interact. It might have been less awkward if the producers did some kind of queer eye setup where they like built them a fake clubhouse. Like imply they're sitting around together in their free time, sipping mimosas and waiting for the next ghost case to come through their door. But hosts aside, the weirdest thing here is the format. Not only is it all these weird clashing parts, but why are they arranged in the order that they're in? You hear about ghosts, and then Brian comes in and proves that there aren't ghosts. His explanation is very good. These are all just different people's views. And then they proceed with the ghost hunting and the psychic, like, yep, there are definitely ghosts. If you want us to be invested in the ghost hunting and psychic segments, why would you debunk it first? Why not close on that? as a counterpoint before we get to the finale. All it does is slow down the momentum of the show with a boring portion that preemptively ruins everything we're about to watch. There's nothing unexplainable or strange in this house. Everything has a plausible explanation. Maybe their initial idea was just a show that debunks hauntings, and that was the whole thing. But then they realized that you can debunk a haunting with a home inspection pretty quickly, and it's not very interesting, and it wouldn't really fill a half hour. And also, it's not that fun. Or maybe the network did like that part, but they were like, also, we need a night vision part where you're running around hunting ghosts because that's what shows are like. But maybe I'm giving it too much credit by even trying to understand the vision. I can see why Paranormal Home Inspectors ran for such a short time, but its weirdness is honestly very endearing to me, and I think it's fun to watch with friends. There are a lot of funny moments in this series, and I highly recommend it. I think it is all illegally on YouTube, but... For full quality, it does also pop up on Netflix or on-demand streaming services. Maybe I'll drop some paranormal home inspector drinking game rules in the description for you guys. The best thing about this series is how the epilogue of every episode confirms the bias of the producers. They show how the client's life has been going since learning the team's findings, and they always pose the question, will you continue living in your house with the understood even though it's haunted. And the client only ever addresses that. They're always like, yes, I am okay with knowing that the ghost is here. I feel safe here, despite the ghost. They never say, 
I reinforced the attic so the raccoons will stop eating my insulation, or I fixed the wiring in my fireplace so it stops spontaneously bursting into flames, or I took down that dangerous mass of wires that I had draped over a light fixture. They just never even mention that stuff again. In a weird way, the framing perfectly illustrates why a show of this premise doesn't work. The people who go on these shows and the people who watch them don't really want to see ghosts debunked. Their minds are already made up at the start of the episode. Sometimes you don't want to solve the problem. You just want someone else to come see that the problem is there and then talk to them about how exciting the problem is. Even if this show had followed all of my suggestions to improve it, do you think I would like it more? It's more fun to watch a ghost show that's bad. Just like it's more fun to have a ghost than to have a door that you didn't install properly. So in a way, the reason this show doesn't work is also the reason that it does. After examining the show, Jenny is comfortable with her findings. Also, they should really spell inspectors in specters, like ghosts. The fact that they don't is yet another example of their folly. She seems at peace, but little did she know that I was the ghost all along. <laughs> Comfortable. What do you think is actually going on in the home? I feel that there's a presence or something, or I'm not sure. That's why I'm hoping that maybe you can give me some answers. What do you think is going on in the home? Nothing. 